Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. After nearly three years, countless hours of debate and multiple revisions, we finally have some major progress on the farm bill. Joining us now is our Ag Policy Specialist Jody Campici. And Jody, you've been pretty busy this week. Why don't we start uh, for our viewers with sort of a general overview of what this new farm bill looks like. Okay, well to start out, I think uh, many people are going to be very happy that, that we've made this progress so far. We'll start with the commodity title. Uh, lots of changes, direct payments are eliminated, counter sickle payments are eliminated, uh, acre payments are eliminated, and sure payments are eliminated. But now they're replaced with uh, some new commodity programs. We have a uh, average risk coverage program, which is called ARC, which is a revenue protection program, uh, very similar to the acre program in the previous farm bill. There's also a price loss coverage, which is uh, the acronym is PLC. You'll start hearing that a lot. Uh, that is a replacement to the counter sickle payment program. As in the 2008 Farm Bill, producers had the option to choose between different commodity programs. This will be the same with this, uh, with this Farm Bill. They'll choose between ARC or PLC on a commodity by commodity basis. Now there's a couple of other uh, interesting things thrown in there as well. There are new supplemental crop insurance programs that a producer would make uh, the decision at the same time as uh, their decisions in F FSA programs, so the commodity title. Now, how this works is that if a producer enrolled in ARC, they wouldn't be eligible for this uh, new supplemental crop insurance program called SCO. If they enroll in uh, the price loss coverage, which is PLC, they would be eligible for the new supplemental crop insurance program. Now, the next thing uh, is it, it's a little bit different this time for cotton producers. Cotton producers are no longer eligible for Title I commodity programs. Now, they are eligible for a different supplemental uh, crop insurance program called STACS. It's the Stacked Income Protection Plan. However, these new supplemental crop insurance programs won't actually be implemented till the 2015 crop year. So what they've done for cotton producers is to provide these transition assistance payments that would be in effect for 2014, likely 2015 if STAX is implemented in uh, certain counties during that year. And that was going to be my next question. When, when do these programs, when does the implement, implementation begin? For the commodity programs uh, in the commodity title, those will, be, those will be implemented with the 2014 crop year. The new crop insurance programs, uh, the supplemental coverage option and the stacks option will likely not be implemented until the 2015 crop year. And let's talk about the Farm Service Agency. There's going to be some streamlining there in terms of the way the operation is set up. Yes, the way the decisions will be uh, set up, producers will make one decision at their Farm Service Agency office and then they'll also have another decision at their local crop insurance agent for these supplemental coverage options. So the decision that they make at, at one depends on their decision at the other. So what needs to happen and what what is planned is that FSA will be able to streamline some of their data processes and be able to better manage data and provide data sharing between the Farm Service Agency and the crop insurance agents. How does the new Farm Bill address conservation programs? Uh, as many have probably heard, there are cuts to conservation programs as there are cuts to most programs. But uh, the main thing to keep in mind is that what they have done is streamline a lot of the programs and instead of having you know, 27 programs to start with, they streamlined them into fewer programs. So many of the same programs are available and producers will still continue uh, with their current enrollment in those programs. But now these programs may just be combined so that the administration of them uh, you know, is a little more efficient. The CRP program, uh, acres that can be enrolled, total acres, is being reduced over the next four years. However, this will not affect current enrollment for those producers who are currently enrolled in the CRP. Let's talk about livestock. There's been a, a lot of discussion in terms of livestock and this farm bill. What has developed there? Uh, I'm sure many of our livestock producers are going to be uh, very happy about the livestock disaster assistance programs that have now been reauthorized. The livestock indemnity program and the livestock forage program have been very important to Oklahoma producers. They were only authorized through October 2011 for the 2008 Farm Bill. So we've had 2012 and 2013, now we're going into 2014 without these programs in place. But the key thing that is included in the Farm Bill is that 
uh, producers will receive coverage for 2012 and 2013 losses. Now, of course, enrolling in these programs and signing up requires bringing in production records and things like that. They have made it a point to stress that they will be flexible in how this process goes about because they're going to know that producers are going to have to go back several years and gather these records uh, that they weren't planning to, to have ready. The other thing is that in the 2008 Farm Bill, to qualify for livestock forage payments, producers needed uh, insurance if insurance is available for the crops on their farm. This requirement has now been dropped, so those producers who need to go back and get coverage for 2012 and 2013 won't have to worry about that insurance coverage requirement. Dairy has been a hot button issue in the Farm Bill debate, a lot for consumers as well. What happened? How did that play out? A lot of changes to the dairy title. This was one of the major sticking points in the Farm Bill. Uh, they've replaced the Dairy Price Support Program. There's a new market stabilization program, a new margin insurance program. Uh, we'll go into a lot of those details later uh, as, as more of those come out, but definitely changes. Uh, I think most are happy with, with how they turned out, that they're still providing some protection for dairy producers and shouldn't really expect milk prices to increase uh, all that much. And then obviously a huge part of the farm bill is food stamps or the SNAP program. How did that end up in the farm bill? Okay, so the SNAP program did receive cuts. Most of the cuts are in relation to uh, those who qualify for SNAP payments and also qualify for the heating assistance program. They've cut out some of the roles that automatically qualified those involved with the heating assistance program for SNAP payments. So. Some, some uh, people will definitely experience uh, you know, cuts from those programs, but it's not overall reductions to the SNAP program in general. A lot of things for you to sort out in the, in the days and weeks ahead, yes. and you're keeping uh, people informed through your website and your newsletter? Yes. Okay. Jody Campiti, our Ag Policy Specialist. And we've set a link for you on our website to Jody's information at sunup.okstate.edu. With the spring calving season just a few days away, I always think it's a good idea to review what's going to happen in a normal calving. Parturition, in the case of the, the bovine, takes place in three different stages. Stage one is uh, the situation that occurs anywhere from about four to 24 hours prior to the actual delivery of the calf. During stage one, we may not see much of what's going on because the really important thing that occurs during stage one is dilation of the cervix. And it's so important that that does occur and occurs completely. At the end of stage one, we may begin to see some of the behavioral changes in cattle where they begin to isolate themselves, walk the fence, ball, perhaps show some discomfort, twitch at their tail, kick at their stomach, the, uh, and the other indication is the relaxation of the ligaments right around the, the tail head in the pelvic area. You have to be very observant to, to see those. Stage two begins when we first see the water bag and stage two ends when we have a calf completely delivered on the ground. Some of the old textbooks and uh, even some of the older fact sheets have suggested that stage two could last two to four hours. We think that's too long. Research at the USDA station at Miles City, Montana, and here at Oklahoma State University has shown us that stage two is going to occur in a first calf heifer, one that's never had a calf before, in about an hour. In the case of the older cow that has had calves previously, it'll only take about 30 minutes. If it's going much longer than that, chances are there's a problem and we need to provide some assistance. So keep that in mind. Stage three, that is the time when we have the expulsion of the uh, placenta of those fetal membranes that have been around the, the calf during the uh, gestation process. This should take place in about eight to 12 hours. If it goes beyond that, then we have what the veterinarians would call a retained placenta. 
we would certainly discourage ranchers from manually removing a retained placenta because you can do more damage than good by doing that. Instead, if the uh, placenta is retained for uh, certainly a day or two after calving, contact your local veterinarian because it may be necessary to have some antibiotic treatment to prevent infection or to treat an infection that's already started. I think if you'll understand what is happening in these three stages of calving, then it'll be easier to recognize if something is going awry during this calving season and you need to get that heifer or cow up to give her the assistance or perhaps call your veterinarian if it's something that's out of your capabilities. Hope this is helpful in this calving season and we sure look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow-Calf Corner. Here in just a couple of months, this field behind us will be full of plants about that tall with big yellow flowers on them, and that's canola. And we're here to talk with Josh Bouchong about the canola crop right now in Oklahoma. What are we seeing? Well, right now we're still in dormancy. The plant's more or less sitting idle. Uh, once we start to warm up quite a bit, the plants will break that dormancy and start to regrow and put on new leaves. Uh, for some beginning growers, losing all these leaves this winter it was kind of a frightening sight for them, uh, but as long as those crowns, that center growing point still green, that plant will put on new leaves and will get more growth and before long it'll start to bolt and flower like you mentioned. So as long as that crown is still alive, and as you can see here, we're starting to put on a few leaves now, but uh, we're still sitting in pretty good shape. Some areas across the state uh, have had a little bit harder, harsher winter than some others, and some certain varieties have handled that winter a little bit better than others, so we are starting to go back to our variety selection from our uh, breeding program up north at Kansas State and able to get some of those lines out of the way but uh, getting out checking your field see how many plants you got what kind of plant population you have and start looking at their at your crop from there so okay so let's let's talk about the cold weather last year we had uh, three or four late freezes d d does that affect canola like it does wheat yes some of those late freezes do impact the canola crop just like in wheat but canola has a slight advantage. It is an indeterminate growth habit. Uh, so even if we do lose those apical mare stems, the plant will put on new shoots and set new buds and flowers uh, lower down on the stem. So it does more or less rebound from some of those late freeze events. Uh, but it's not like wheat where we lose that whole tiller. The plant does rebound some. Does it hurt us on some yield? More than likely. Uh, but it's hard to quantify how much those late freezes actually hurt us. But. but but right now here in January and February, we're okay with that. So so producers need to be looking for uh, for what in their fields? Well, right now, like I said, check your stands. While you're out there scouting your fields, also be looking for bugs. Uh, some of our seed treatments are already worn off, so start looking for aphids now. Uh, and also be looking out for worms, your diamondback moth larva, uh, your army cutworms, and stuff and some other worms like that. So be on the lookout for insects and also see if you have any weed escapes from your fall herbicide or if you haven't sprayed a herbicide yet, see if it's getting to that point where you need to start spraying. Uh, but obviously let it warm up a little bit to get a little bit better efficiency out of those herbicides. But check your crop, uh, make sure you have a, a decent crop, uh, check for weeds and insects, and also start thinking about putting your top dress down. Uh, just like wheat, many producers top dress the remaining nitrogen on their canola this time of year. Uh, so canola takes a little bit more nitrogen than wheat, about two and a half pounds of nitrogen per bushel of canola. So minus whatever you put down pre-plant, whatever you have in the soil, and whatever your yield goal is, uh, you need to put that remainder nitrogen out before too long. Some other guys are adding sulfur uh, products in there, some ammonium theophosphate or any kind of sulfate form uh, will be available to the plant. So get out there, check your crop, see if you need to spray any pesticides and see uh, if you need to start top dressing before long. Okay, and, and producers across the Southern Great Plains are gonna have an opportunity to, to, to talk with you personally about this coming up at a conference. Yes, uh, the Great Plains Canola Association is hosting their Canola College event again this year in Enid uh, at the Expo Center at the fairgrounds. So. Uh, it's on February 13th. Uh, there's going to be uh, about eight different presenters there covering seven different topics, anything from basic agronomy to advanced agronomy, soil fertility, insect control, weed control, 
uh, no-till management, and also harvest options. So anything more or less about canola production or any new or advanced producer, uh, feel welcome to attend the free event. There is an online registration, so uh, get online and be sure to get your name in and make sure we have enough meals. So. Okay, thank you very much, Josh. And we'll put a link to that website on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet weather report. The last week in January has been quite the mix. Swings from mild temperatures to brutal cold. High winds to low and back to high again. As January ends, we fall further and further behind in moisture. A map showing the number of days since at least a quarter of an inch of precipitation was recorded reveals just how dry some places are. As of Wednesday, Goodwell and Hooker had gone 110 days without at least a quarter inch of moisture. Moving east, we see counts in the 60s and then 30s for central Oklahoma. Poor Alva's count is 122 days. The light green areas are faring better at 18 days. That lack of rainfall has led to some high burning indexes even when air temperatures are cold. A burning index map from 11 a.m. Monday, January 27th had most of the state colored orange with a fair amount of red mixed in. If a fire started in the red areas, it would likely have a flame height of 6 to 8 feet at the head of the fire. That same Monday morning, the air temperatures bottomed out in the teens for the majority of the state. The highs for that day for many locations stayed in the 30s. The areas with higher fire danger reached into the 40s in the southwest and only mid-30s in north-central locations. Just after midnight in the earliest hours of Monday, January 27th, high winds moved across Oklahoma. Hinton had a peak wind gust of 58 miles per hour at 12.30 a.m. For most of the state, winds gusted to 40 or higher, the gold-colored numbers. With the heightened fire risk, 23 counties and three cities had active burn bans on Wednesday, January 29th. The counties with burn bans are scattered across Oklahoma from south to north and from Highway 183 in the west to the Arkansas line. The three cities with burn bans are Oklahoma City, Edmond, and Midwest City. Tuesday morning gave us some very low cattle comfort index values. Only eight mesonet locations came in at zero or above. That left 112 locations in the negative range. Goodwell and Hooker came in the lowest at minus 17. We'll have to see how much this cold weather reduces cattle gain and its impact on cattle health. If you watched Sunup last week, you learned about the new Mesonet First Hollow Stem Advisor. Wheat varieties fall into one of three categories of First Hollow Stem Initiation, early, middle, and late. Check the online list to find out groupings for your wheat varieties. A heat unit map through Tuesday, January 28th for the early group shows Newport at 609 heat units. So for wheat fields around Newport, it is time to scout wheat varieties in the early first hollow stem group. Wheat outside that localized area will be later. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. Wheat prices challenging the support levels this week. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, is joining us now to sort it all out. And Kim, tell us what's been going on and what's changed in the past couple of weeks. Well, you know, you can go back uh, two or three weeks ago, we'd had a 30 cent price rally. I was saying hopefully and, and possibly uh, wheat prices had bottomed out for the year. We've taken out that 30 cents. Uh, this week, we challenged that uh, $6 price level for the Kansas City March and July contracts. July actually got down to uh, $5.99. It closed at 6 so it, we haven't closed below it, but we're sure putting pressure on that low price now. 
And then, of course, we can't talk about prices without considering how corn is factoring in. Well, this time last year, uh, uh, wheat prices were 40 cents higher than corn prices. Right now, wheat is a dollar and 40 cents above uh, corn. So we don't have the corn prices this year to support wheat prices. And so when wheat prices start falling, there's just nothing there to hold except for the demand for the wheat. And then how do crop conditions and, and the drought picture play in? That's another thing we don't have. You know, you can go back down to uh, 2011 or 2013 when we had drought conditions, when we had a, a short crop uh, that supported wheat prices. Crops in relatively good condition right now, and so uh, the market's reacting to that. Okay, with stocks below average, why are prices below average then? This is sort of the opposite of what you would think would be what would happen. I started cranking through a lot of numbers to determine what was going on there, but if you'll look at 2011 and 2013, U.S. wheat production was below average, world production was above average, and we had relatively low prices, good prices, but relatively low. In 2012, uh, U.S. Uh, wheat production was above average, world was below, and we had even higher prices. So what we've got is the case of where the United States produces about 8.8 percent .8 of world production, world production and world stocks trump U.S. production and stops. So the world is, is driving our price now. Okay, good perspective. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about potential light and uh, different places to put those in your shop. So a good handy way to do that is to, to do like Randy did here is build a boom and you can put some lights off of it, your hang light, you could pull some air off of it. Yeah, there's a lot of different things you can do. The nice thing is it's kind of overhead, but it's out of the way. We've got high ceilings like a lot of our shops do, so your overhead lights may not be putting it right where you want it. But uh, now we're not, I'm not dragging lights out all the time. I've got it right here. And see, he's also got this where he can bring it over his bench over next to the, next to the wall as well. So, and then it'll keep in place there. So mm. just a, a flexible piece of conduit over at the pivot point, lets you keep all your wiring enclosed as, uh, as you should when you're uh, putting it together. So that's just a little shop idea from Shop Stop this week. We'll see you next time. Now here's SunUp's Austin Moore with a new learning opportunity coming up for you this spring. Pop quiz. What do wild hogs, kudzu, and the brown marmorated stink bug have in common? The answer? They're all invasive species. So it can be a wide variety of plants, animals, bacteria, viruses, insects. And it's mainly an organism that is not native to the U.S. or to the, the region that it's causing the problem. And we tend to focus on three major problems that the invasive causes. And that would be harm to human health, harm to the economy, okay, so it affects negatively crop production, or we have to spend money to control it. And the third major reason is because it causes harm to the native plants and animals, the native biodiversity. It might be a really aggressive species in terms of its uh, competitive ability. It can outcompete um, other organisms. Uh, um, sometimes it might be the environment into which that, that invasive species is introduced. And uh, so it might be something like a climatic factor uh, where you know, the climate is just right, just perfect. It's optimal for that, um, that invasive species to flourish. Sometimes it might be that the environment that, um, the new environment where the invasive species is introduced into might be uh, devoid of predators and parasitoids and even pathogens maybe. And, and because those natural enemies are missing, their, their numbers just explode. At the U.S. level, there was a study done about a decade ago that said we're spending over $138 billion a year in lost production and cost for controlling those. So if we look at that level of expense and break it down to Oklahoma and the fact that we are a major agricultural state, then we know that that is going to be a significant um, cost to the state of Oklahoma. And so later this spring, 
Oklahoma Cooperative Extension will host the Oklahoma Invasive Species Conference. The cool thing about this particular conference is that it's multidisciplinary. So many of the conferences that we've had in the state have focused on maybe one species, eastern red cedar for instance, um, or just plants. This particular um, conference is going to have presentations on insects that are damaging, um, aquatic um, uh, invasive species, animals, uh, vertebrates, so feral hog, um, plants, and then also some, um, some legislative kind of activities that are important for the state. The conference will be held March 25th in Oklahoma City. Early registration is due March 10th. If you'd like more information, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. That'll do it for us this week. Remember, you can find us anytime at sunup.okstate.edu. You can also follow us on YouTube and other social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a nice week, everyone, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.